in part three of our consideration on uh, God-given authority over the enemy, I want to continue to reflect upon the right use of this authority as we acknowledge that all authority comes from God and it does not remotely, remotely come from us. Uh, I'm reading a portion of a footnote in um, Mark chapter 3, verses 11 through 15 in the third section of the book. Um, and I'll just read a portion of this verse. And unclean spirits, when they saw him, fell down before him and cried, saying, Thou art the Son of the Thou art the Son of God, and he straightly charged them that they should not make him known. Uh, and he goeth into a mountain and calleth unto him whom he would, and they came unto him, and he ordained twelve that they should be with him, and that they he might send them forth to preach, and to have power to heal sicknesses and to cast out devils. Uh, my point that I want to make first is that the uh, the right use of this authority comes from God and not from us strutting about and saying we're a king's kid or something. And I want to read a couple verses that are frequently not correctly interpreted. Um, normally when I read scripture, I read from the King James Version. Uh, I like the King James Version because I believe that it's translated from the best original manuscripts. And I also like the King James Version because it's public domain and there's no greedy publisher with their greedy copyright in hand trying to control how I can use their Bible, right? Uh, my Bible says the Word of God cannot be chained, right? So uh, I like to use public domain versions where I can use it however I feel like God leading me to use it and the little publishers can go hoard away their money or whatever they're doing, right? Um, another example of a public domain manuscript is, or, um, I guess it'd be a translation, it really wouldn't be a manuscript, but the, another example of a public domain Bible is a Young's literal translation, and I like this sometimes because they kind of just get it uh, the heart of the language that sometimes other versions kind of gloss over. Um, and so Matthew sixteen nineteen, I will give to thee the keys of the reign of the heavens, and whatever thou mayest bind upon the earth shall be having been bound in the heavens, and whatever thou mayest loose upon the earth shall having been loosed in the heavens. And so let's read that verse um, in comparison to how they render it in the King James. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on the earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on the earth shall be loosed in heaven. And so you recognize whenever you listen to this version, and most modern translations translated in a very similar way, they're acting like, oh, well, if I bind something, if I bind something, then it is bound forever. And if I, 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 Lose something, then it didn't lose forever. And it's kind of this this uh, smug, self-sufficient, don't you know who I am kind of an attitude, which God is never impressed with. And the, the real question is, do we know who he is? He is the I am, not us, right? Always. Um, it, it, it seems as though we have a power to bind and loose things, and then even the things that we bind and loose will be bound and loose in heaven. Um, except that the the um, the neglect of the King James is what's called the perfect passive participle in the original Greek text, which denotes something that has already been done, right? And so again, I'm going to read Matthew 16, 19 out of Young's. Uh, I will give to thee the keys of the reign of the heavens. Whatever thou mayest bind on the earth shall having been bound in the heavens. And whatever thou mayest loose upon the earth shall having been loosed in the heavens. And so if you're binding something, it's because God already did it and already planned for it to happen. It's not because you're Mr. Strutter, right? And if you lose something, 
It's again because God already did it and planned for it to happen, not because you're Mr. Fancy Pants and every tongue shall confess and every knee shall bow you, right? You're not Jesus, right? And I'm not Jesus. Um, uh, a similar scripture again in Matthew chapter 18, verses 18 through 20. Verily I say to you, whatever things ye may bind upon the earth shall having been bound in the heavens, and whatever things ye may loose on the earth shall having been loosed in the heavens. Again, I say to you that if two of you may agree on the earth concerning anything, whatever they may ask, it shall be done to them from my Father who is in the heavens. For where there are two or more, two or three gathered together to my name, there I am in the midst of them. And so the point uh, that I want to make is that we are using this authority for God's will and for God's glory and God's plan and God's purpose and not us um, supposing that we are going to do something for ourselves. And of course, we don't need to look any farther than the life of Jesus, right? Where he he in his person is the word of God. In the beginning, the word was with God and the word was God. Verse 14, the word became flesh and tabernacle, tabernacled among us. Um, and we see the similar kind of spirit or some similar kind of attitude in the Holy Spirit. Um, boy, if there's anybody who's God and if there's anybody who has power and authority, it's Jesus and it's the Holy Spirit. But yet, the Holy Spirit submits himself to Jesus, only saying what Jesus tells him to say. And Jesus only submits himself to the Father, only saying what the Father tells him to say. Only judging how the Father shows him to judge. Only doing what the Father shows him to do. Matthew twenty six thirty nine. he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me, nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. John five thirty thirty. I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. Right? And so, Jesus delights to do the will of the Father, even though he is the very word of God and the fullness of the Godhead bodily. He submits himself to the Father. Uh, you can see this. I have a, a chapter called "The Order of the Order of Operations in the Trinity," and you can read read that chapter for more of those scriptures if you want to. Um, finally, uh, let's just consider that um, God always had intended for man to have a measure of authority on the earth. And we see this not only in Genesis chapter 1, but we also see this after the fall in Genesis chapter 9 and in Psalm 8. And so I'm going to read from some of those passages. So Genesis 1, uh, verses 28 through 30. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, of course Adam and Eve, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given to you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of the earth, and every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed, to you it shall be for meat, and to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. And so God gave the delegated authority over subduing and ruling the earth to Adam and Eve and his descendants, which include you and me, right? Now, somebody may argue, well, yeah, but then we fell, and so God had to take it back again. Somebody may say something like that. Well, that's not actually true, and we can see that from two different scriptures that are post-fall. So Genesis chapter 9, this is after the flood, and every single living thing on the earth was wiped out, save that which was in the ark, which God had commanded for Noah to build. Uh, so Genesis 9, 
verse 1. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Does this sound familiar? Uh, and the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moveth upon the earth and upon all the fishes of the sea. Into your hand are they delivered. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb I have given you all things. And then Psalm 8, again post-fall, um, verses 3 through 9, When I consider the heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars, which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the work of thy hands, and thou hast put all things under his feet. All sheep and oxen, yea, the beasts of the field, and the fowl of the air, and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. And so this delegated authority that God issued from the beginning and upheld repeatedly hasn't changed, right? God has given us authority and dominion over the earth. But then, of course, does that mean that we can just rape, plunder, and pillage everything in our path because God has given us a measure of authority and stewardship over the earth? No. The person who has delegated authority is always responsible to give an account to the person who gave him the authority, and ultimately, we recognize that there are some big men in the world, powerful men who lord it over uh, the people beneath them. But there is nobody on the earth who has authority that has not been delegated to them. And so even the Pope, <laughs> um, even a king, even an emperor, even a czar, whatever kind of a grand title that you can make up, and whatever ability you have to accumulate power and riches to yourself, you are still accountable to the one who ultimately is the source of the authority, of the power, of the wealth, of the ability. So this authority God had always intended for man to have and I want to make a point about um, I want to make a point about uh, Satan in Luke chapter four, whenever he tempts Jesus, and he makes this statement, um, starting Luke chapter four, verse five, and the devil taking him up into a high mountain showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time, and the devil said unto him, all this power. You can also translate that word authority. All this will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will I give it. If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. And Jesus answered and said unto him, using scripture, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And so first of all, we recognize kind of the narcissism of Satan. He wants to be God. He wants to be worshipped as God. And he knows that Jesus is the Son of God. And uh, that, what a funny thing. It'd be like, what if an ant, a, a little ant on the ground, walked up to you and said, Worship me, and I will give you my ant kingdom. <laughs> and you just like, deek, like, <laughs> smush in the ground. Like, no, I'm not. Like, I'll smush you and spray some raid on your ant kingdom and see what happens to it, right? Um, but Satan is talking here as though he's the one who has authority over the earth, ultimately, and not God and not man. And so how do, we, how do we reconcile what I've just said? That man has been given authority over the earth um, by God. And that didn't change after the fall. Well, the answer is that Satan works and has sway in the heart of man. And so it is through man that he is able to use this power to give the kingdoms of the earth to whomever he wants, right? 
Um, and just a quick note about witchcraft. Why in the world does the devil tempt men with power? Power and information, which is derived through the rituals associated with witchcraft. Well, it's the, the fundamental recognition I think that's important is that man has been given authority over the earth and the devil uses that authority and he says, hey, come into agreement with this thing, jump through this hoop, make this sacrifice, do this incantation, whatever, do this thing, and then you will have power. But Satan is taking advantage of man's authority on the earth and causing that to come into agreement with the power from Satan. Um, and so just considering, uh, Paul writes to Timothy that um, people who don't accept the truth are in the snare of the devil, that God might grant repentance to that person and they might escape the snare of the devil. And then also we have Ephesians chapter 2. Um, I'll just read verse 1 through 3. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. We are in times past. He walked according to the course of this world according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversion in times past, our conversation in times past, in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. And so um, Satan is operating in the hearts of men, uh, the spirit that now worketh in the sons of disobedience, and it is through that mechanism that he is the ruler of the world. But uh, authority ultimately is God's, as I've been saying over and over again. And some of that authority on the earth has been delegated to man.